Today is a day in which I'm going to talk about a few words and say a few words. But as we were praying our prayer for good and growth, there were two things that came to mind. It's pretty amazing to pray for wisdom and strength enough to put aside selfish rivalries and reactionary divisions today. When we see those things, those actions, so paramount in front of us every day. So all I can say as a pastor is we keep praying. We keep working, keep voting, keep praying, and keep hope before us in times like this. And the other thing is you may notice it says we, we, we see ourselves as we are one body as Christ Jesus in the world. Um, the, um, I'm not crying right now. I have, I don't know, it's an allergy or something. And it's in my eye. The, and I'm not lying. Ask Mike. Um, the, 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 the deal is this, this aspect of Christ Jesus. I, I, I put that in there and I did that on purpose. Because we, we have, I've grown up, you know, the little Methodist boy growing up in northern Wisconsin, blah, blah, blah. Church is the body of Christ. Church is the body of Christ. You know, that kind of thing. And then um, it is this aspect of Jesus in the world and that sort of thing. And then I grew up and many years ago, many years later, um, a couple years ago in a, January, I went up to school and I spent a 60-hour solid intensive week with the Apostle Paul through this uh, Professor Park, and uh, as, as he taught, and it was, in, but it wasn't him, it was this other person who had, was the emeritus New Testament professor who came and talked to us for an afternoon when he explained that there are two ways that Paul used Jesus' name in the scriptures, Jesus Christos and Christos Jesus, okay? Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. And his explanation, after all of his years of Bible study and all of his sort of thing with that and the working with the Hebrew and all of that, was that when Paul, whose works were later altered, which is where we get all this Paul junk, but anyway, the Paul baggage is not his own, but that's a whole other story. Um, the, the baggage of Paul came later. But the, the Paul, the authentic Pauline that they can figure out is that Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ, was speaking of the man. And Paul did believe that. Speaking of the itinerant preacher, the teacher, the rabbi. Christos Jesus, Christ Jesus, is the church, the people. Whether we, you know, however we are. And you have to remember, remember how Jesus was human? And we are human? And Jesus sassed his mother and cursed out some other people and killed a tree and did all sorts of things, you know? We have those capacities too. Um, and so the church, as, 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 as a gathered with all of our flaws and our goodness, um, that's the Jesus Christos. And so that's why I say, help us remember, we are one body as Christ Jesus in the world. So we can trust those promises. That's what that is, let's pray. Bless us, loving God, as we continue in our worship together. We are so blessed by the music and the singing and the readings and the prayers. It's a powerful day. And we're thankful that we're here gathered in this moment to be able to benefit from your spirit among us on this day. Continue to be with us as we know you are and never are gone. Continue. Help us to sense our anointment as we are in worship together and help us to know that as people have prayed many years ago that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth are acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Now, another word that I have today, I, I don't know how many or what any of us think is a good definition of heaven. A good definition of heaven. I think some people, when they think of heaven, they think Fantasy Island. The plane, the plane. Some people remember promises that, you know, really come from old movies or Renaissance paintings 
as well as from ancient writings, but they're the visions that people get in their heads. Visions of streets paved with gold and pearly gates and all sorts of things that are completely impractical. Some people think of eternal rest. Some people, in saying, instead of saying rest in peace, say rest in power. Some people en envision this as total empowerment, being in heaven. Many think of joining beloved ancestors, and others think of something else or of nothing at all. Some of you will remember that I think heaven is another aspect of our living on an eternal continuum. Just as the Bible writers had many versions, I think about heaven in different ways at different times. There's no need in my mind to get too specific, and I'm gonna to say to you, there's no need to get too specific in your minds. However, I think we get glimpses of heaven. I think we get glimpses of heaven here on earth every now and then. And that's dependable. Now let me suggest to you that the realm of God is observable in everyday life. Whenever you and I witness an act of justice or of kindness. When the falsely accused and imprisoned have been proven innocent and are walking free, there is a glimpse of the realm of God. When a caregiver comforts a patient, that is a glimpse of heaven. When people are duly respected and given the honor of equality throughout humanity, heaven is among us. And when welcome is the consummate value, heaven is emulated. Now, if we remember today's gospel reading that Carl read so beautifully, careful listeners heard kingdom used instead of the more familiar concept of kingdom. I learned kingdom in Bible school. Our inclusive translation recognizes that the term kingdom misleads people as it implies geography and real estate with an owner other than yourself. The inclusive translators think kingdom implies the aspect of relationship without borders. And that is what is meant to be conveyed. Relationship trumps real estate in the heavenly realms and values. In my practice, the word realm seems more user-friendly than even kingdom, but realm still implies borders, which is a limitation. <coughs> Heaven is about relationships in the biblical text. Always remember that protecting borders is not part of God's relationship with us. Involving heart and soul and mind and strength in our understanding of what we give in a good relationship means we maintain no borders with God. We give it all and we lose nothing except hopefully injustice and hate. Another word to consider from today's gospel is blessed. The word blessed or blessed, which is the way I learned it growing up. Blessed are they, you know, blessed. Blessed is common in our language. Uh, have a blessed day. Um, blessed. There's evidently there's a hashtag blessed thing on Twitter now, which uh, I, I haven't connected with yet. Just wait. The one I learned as we memorized the Beatitudes was blessed, you know, back in confirmation class in either eighth or ninth grade. <laughs> blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. And at that early age, I was a little confused when I was handed a new translation of the Bible that just came out, actually the New Testament at the time and later the whole Bible, a new, a new translation that came out and it was all the rage among liberal Protestants and it was called the Good News for Modern Man. It was a version of common language in which the Beatitudes did not read blessed and that was confusing. It said happy. 
happy is better in my book. There are many blessed or blessed people, depending upon your attitude toward them. They're blessed or they're blessed. There are many blessed people walking around while being unhappy. But I am, and careful for the triple negative that's coming, I am not sure I know anyone who is unhappy who is not blessed. Once again, words matter. Let me read the passage again as the RKV, and that would be the Rev Kev version. <laughs> when Jesus saw the crowds, from Matthew's writing, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountainside, and after he sat down and the disciples had gathered around, Jesus began to teach them. Happy are those who are mourning, they will be consoled. Happy are those who are gentle, they will inherit the land. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for just, justice, they will have their fill. Happy are those who show mercy to others, they will be shown mercy. Happy are those whose hearts are clean, they will see God. Happy are those who work for peace, they will be called children of God. Happy are those who are persecuted because of their struggles for justice. The heavenly realm is theirs. You are fortunate when others insult you and persecute you and utter all kinds of slander against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice for your reward in the heavenly realm is great. They persecuted the prophets before you in the very same way. Now, you know, I could spend a lot of time talking about that last one, about you're fortunate when people insult you and persecute you. And I know how that's been misused and abused in cultures to this day, but there's not enough time to do that today, so let's just keep moving. Besides, today being Groundhog Day, Besides today being Groundhog Day, <laughs> besides today being Groundhog Day, February is Black History Month in the United States of America. Now I am 66 years old and I remember seeing fire hoses, dogs and angry shouts and spitting being the actions of white people on TV as American citizens of many colors marched for equal rights in civil matters. I remember when Christian and Jewish religious leaders locked arms with Abernathy and King to march down streets and sidewalks in actions of nonviolent protest. And many times they got violence in return. Today's violence is not so much about dogs and fire hoses. Violence is perpetuated today with guns and knives and online postings of comments. Jesus of the Gospels talked about bodily harm being external but ill-tempered words being worse. Long after bruises heal, word wounds remain in our minds. And that is why it is important for us to be vigilant and vital with our tongues and in our actions to counteract the ill feelings and lasting effects of the pressures of our time. I learned a few years ago from people of color that white people are responsible for our own actions and it's up to white people to teach ourselves about black history. Because until we know some of it, we won't be able to empathize and identify with the struggles and scars that remain for many from almost all of it. The principle applies across rainbow spectrums. And if I started listing them again, we'd be here all day. But please, you can ask me later if you'd like me to enumerate some more examples. For now, let's remember this. CNN reported that 60 years ago yesterday, four African-American college students quietly sat down at a whites-only Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, and waited. They kept waiting. 
despite receiving no service and requests to leave. And the next day they came back and they waited again. Within three days of their protest beginning, as they came back each day to wait again, more than 300 students joined the Greensboro Four and their sit-in. And in the following months, their actions sparked a wave of similar demonstrations in restaurants and other segregated spaces throughout the South, transforming the fight against Jim Crow era segregation and marking the turning point in the civil rights movement. That was 1960. Four students created heaven on a lunch counter stool when they embodied the Beatitudes all at once. We can do something like that too. The poet laureate of Santa Cruz County, California is named Denusha Lamparis. She is a rising star in literary circles and her poem entitled Small Kindnesses was recently featured, published in the New York Times Magazine. This is a short and simple poem that offers contemporary insight in common ways. The Beatitudes of the Sermon on, uh, the Beatitudes of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount that we heard today were recorded for a similar purpose. Simple words providing contemporary insight in common ways. So now listen for another version of holy. Listen for connection with the realm of heaven. Listen for the ways we become the manifestation. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull their legs to let you go by. How strangers still say, bless you, when someone sneezes, a leftover from the bubonic plague. Don't die, we were saying. And sometimes when you spill lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. Maybe we don't want to harm each other. We want to be handed our cup of coffee, coffee hot to, to say, and to say thank you to the person handing it to smile at them and for them to smile back and for the waitress to call us honey when she sets down the bowl of clam chowder and for the driver in the red pickup truck to let us pass. We have so little of each other now, so far from tribe and fire, only these brief moments of exchange what if they are the true dwelling of the holy? These fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have, have my seat. Go ahead, you first. I like your hat. Today, as we gather around our common table as resurrection people and we share in Holy Communion, we remember that small actions can be beautiful, can be heavenly, can make us happy. Small actions based in love and justice are like stitches in a quilt that we see as a whole one day in the future. Seeing the quilt gives us a perspective on heaven, and the blanket statement I will make is that the love that made the creation is among us all and for us all to give and to receive. And we remember the words of Jesus, do this in remembrance of me. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.